Okay, good morning. Thank you for joining us from uh, here in London and welcome to today's webinar with an oil and gas focus. Today's topic will be looking at meeting challenges in the lower for longer oil and gas environment. Uh, just a couple of very quick slides I'd like to go through with you before we get things uh, kicked off. Today we will discuss the role of engineering simulation within the oil and gas industry with a specific focus on how design exploration can help to meet the challenges posed in the current conditions. We have two presenters with us today. First, Dr. Matt Straw from Norton Straw Consultants will provide us with his thoughts on how engineering simulation and design exploration can help make engineers be more efficient and deliver designs faster, as well as discussing where simulation can be used within the oil and gas industry. He will also use a number of case studies relating to oil and gas production and operations. Uh, just to give a brief bio of Matt, Matt is an engineering graduate from Nottingham University and gained his master's and PhD in the development of CFD techniques for wind engineering and natural ventilation. He has been involved in simulation for nearly 20 years and has spent at least the last 16 working in upstream oil and gas industries. In 2011, he founded Norton Straw Consultants to help the oil and gas industry use simulation technology. Following Matt's talk, Alex Graham, who is the technical specialist in oil and gas at Siemens PLM Software, will provide us with further examples of design space exploration within oil and gas and will include a demonstration in the application of STAR CCM Plus CFD software to design exploration of a drill bit. And to give a brief bio for Alex, Alex has a master's in engineering science and began using STAR CCM Plus at the Lotus F1 team in 2008, where he worked as a CFD aerodynamicist. After that, he joined CD Adapco as an application engineer and now focuses on the oil and gas industry. So at this point, I would like to hand over to our first presenter, Dr. Matt Straw. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, the guys at Siemens, to, uh, to present to you this morning. And as, as Jay said, uh, I was asked to come and give a presentation about some of the ways that, uh, that we at Norton Straw Consultants believe that engineering simulation can help the, the design process and the engineering process within oil and gas and specifically focused on the market challenges that we've faced over the last two years. We've had sustained low oil prices and it's time now we all move on. Uh, we still have to deliver projects. We have operations that are working and, and processing. Uh, and so what's the role that engineering simulation can bring both to those operations, but also to the engineering design processes that are around that. So I'm going to talk for around 20 minutes today with the aim of giving some thoughts on, on sort of how we see here at Norton Straw engineering simulation being able to help the design and, uh, and operations processes, uh, and then give you some case studies uh, of relating to the real world examples of how We've used simulation coupled with design space exploration to, to deliver better designs or lower cost designs uh, faster than we could do if we were doing it without the design exploration side. And I'll come on to talk a little more around what we term design exploration and sort of what it, what it is in a little while. But I think just to start out things, we are in a low cost, lower cost environment, margins are squeezed, oil prices sustainably been uh, down around the $50 per barrel mark, and I think the analysts aren't looking for that to change anytime soon. So companies have had to change how they do things, both in terms of the equipment and the engineering systems that are being designed and operated, uh, standardization, lower cost uh, products that still deliver performance, uh, and through life costs all need to reduce in terms of the equipment, but also the engineering activities, the time, the costs associated with the engineering aspects of both new developments and existing uh, oil and gas facilities uh, had increased prior to the downturn in the market, uh, and therefore there's a real focus on how we can bring those down. So I, I want to talk about putting both of those in context of, of what we do here at Norton Straw Consultants, which is engineering design and analysis, often using uh, engineering simulation tools to, uh, to deliver, deliver that. So we'll talk initially about how simulation is typically used and some of the issues that, that I believe it brings and how they could be resolved if we did things differently. Uh, talk a little about uh, how simulation can aid design uh, and also how used in different ways that maybe most of us use it currently, we could increase our efficiency of, of the engineers and the, the analysts that are using the tools to deliver things more quickly, more efficiently, and more effectively. Uh, and then I'll go on to 
two, two examples uh, related to, uh, to what I've introduced. So the first half of the presentation really is, is to talk about the concept, the second half more about applications. Just a quick acknowledgement, this work is, is actually founded on a presentation uh, that I gave at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers conference on low-cost design for oil and gas late in 2016 using the case studies that we developed for that. So thanks to the co-authors, Nate Chase and Alex Reed, who uh, were very actively involved in the original paper. But I have changed it slightly for the topic of, of today. So just not knowing where people are in terms of their understanding of what we talk about, when, what we mean in engineering analysis and engineering simulation, really we're looking at simulating real world physics and real world phenomena and behavior to aid in the design of engineering equipment and systems. So we're able to analyze and simulate most phenomena that exist in related to oil and gas that involves fluid mechanics, flow and heat transfer, uh, the transportation of solid materials, whether that be sand, drill cuttings, or, or other produced produced solids. We can understand structural and mechanical behavior of systems, uh, chemistry and reactions, electronics and electromagnetics, uh, and lots of different physics. And there are many different tools that we can use. Uh, we can use detailed analyses like computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis for the structural and thermal behavior. Uh, but that's the detailed end. We also have tools that allow us to simulate networks and systems uh, at lower order, so maybe one-dimensional simulation or network models. So analysis and simulation encapsulates a whole host of different tools and methods. Really, the work we'll focus on here is at the detailed end, so computational fluid dynamics uh, and finite element analysis, uh, and there's just some examples on the screen there. And in terms of, we can model lots of different physics, uh, and because we can model lots of different behavior and lots of different physics in oil and gas, Simulation is used very widely uh, throughout the whole industry, both upstream and downstream. But here's a, an image that just encapsulates the upstream oil and gas business and where we're involved in our business, certainly in using engineering analysis and simulation tools to solve engineering problems, all the way starting down in the, uh, around the reservoir, but more in the, the well bore and in subsurface applications, through the subsea field and architecture, looking at issues to do with thermal design, managing multi-phase flow and flow assurance issues, erosion, corrosion. Uh, when we get to production facilities, we can use simulation to design and optimize separation and process equipment, whether that be uh, hydrocyclones, produced water, primary separators, or process equipment like heat exchangers uh, and flare systems. We have process safety where gas dispersion, fire simulation, uh, blast and explosion predictions are, are commonplace in the industry. Uh, and of course, a lot of the oil and gas industry takes place in a marine environment, uh, and therefore the marine operations, the design of offshore structures, the behavior of, uh, of vessels during the installation process of offshore and subsea facilities are all areas where simulation is very widely used in uh, the oil and gas industry. Uh, if we start out looking, first of all, of what we would want from engineering simulation, I sat and had a think about what it is we want as, a, as an engineering company, uh, what we want to deliver from the use of engineering simulation and the value we should get that out of that in the design process. So on the left, we have sort of the targets of what we want out of the use of simulation and analysis. And on the right is my thoughts on, on what is more commonplace in, uh, in our industry, but not just oil and gas, I think it's, it's common. We work in lots of different industries, and I don't think we are as different from other industries. Some are, are further ahead than, us, than others. But uh, if we take what we fundamentally want, which is to design equipment and products uh, with simulation, so use simulation to lead that design process, understand the, the behavior before we've actually made something, have a digital representation of, of our concept. We can evaluate those conceptual designs understand how they're going to perform and get to the best design quickly. I think more often than not, simulation is used uh, later in the process to, to verify designs, uh, and therefore the simulation uh, approach is, is less used to lead the design than verify decisions that have already been made, which can lead to, uh, to other issues, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, it would be good if our simulation activities, so the modeling of the behavior of our conceptual or, or basic design, it would be integrated with the design activities. So a design team sitting coming up with ideas is very integrated with the simulation process. I think more often than not, the simulation 
team or the engineers performing simulation and analysis are, are separated from the design team. Uh, physically, in many instances, sitting in different locations, different parts of an office. Uh, organizationally, they may report to different parts where a team designing kit equipment may report to one aspect, uh, and you might have a centrally resourced simulation team, so they organizationally sit differently, and even digitally, may be using different, uh, different platforms, uh, different models, one may be designing the CAD and not sharing that with the, uh, the simulation team and when that's updated. So digitally, there is a, a separation there which, which causes issues. When we're using simulation, we really want to explore the full opportunity, the, the full design space, the full range of options that we have. Uh, but to do that, that might mean many hundreds, many thousands, potentially even many millions of, uh, of simulations, which is impractical. Uh, and so the typical way we, we do it is to sample a number of design possibilities based on our experience, based on our previous uh, understanding of how systems behave. And if we could understand the full range of options better, then, then maybe we could use, get the value out of simulation or, or greater value out of simulation. Uh, we would like to be able to account for all the requirements and constraints that are on our design or on our engineering process. So, so they, the constraints and requirements are greater than just the technical aspects of the, the performance, uh, the strength, the process performance, the efficiency. Uh, if we could also account for things like the cost, the schedule within a simulation process, then I believe we would gain great, greater value out of that. And I'm going to give an example of how we can bring cost into the simulation process in a moment. Uh, typically, because we have segmented or uh, design uh, simulation teams, maybe the fluid mechanics, the structural team sit separately. Uh, one may be designing or simulating a design based on a structural requirement, another team on a process performance requirement, and those two might have conflicting results. It might be that to get the right pipe wall thickness for the structural requirement uh, impacts the thermal performance of a system based on the process. And so if we can integrate those together, those requirements, then, uh, then we can get to the answer quicker. And what we would hope at the end of it is that we use simulation to replace testing, to understand things better, to take away uh, gut feel, uh, and to, or to give us better understanding of, of making those decisions, and therefore get to designs in reduced time. Uh, and hopefully that is really where we want to get to, get better designs faster. And I think that is where we want to get to, rather than maybe what we have today. So I think this, this graph here, uh, helps understand the difference between where we are now. So if we look at these three boxes, the, the vertical axis we, have, axis, we have the value we can obtain from simulation and, and design exploration. Uh, and along the, uh, the horizontal axis, we sort of have the way we use simulation currently, the sort of purpose of how we use it. So typically where we work at the moment as, uh, as engineers, and I, I include ourselves in this in most of our work, we, we validate uh, a model, we validate the performance of a system uh, and then we use that understanding and validation to understand and troubleshoot how a design is going to perform. And once we understand that, we can go ahead and predict uh, its behavior under different conditions, or if we change the design, we predict its behavior, how it might change in the future. If we move to what we could do, if we could automate more of that process, that design exploration process, uh, use tools to automate the simulation process, and use tools to explore how changes in design and changes in conditions uh, can, can it, it impact the performance of the equipment or the system, then really the value starts to increase quite rapidly. And hopefully that's what I'm going to show in the next examples. So here's the, initially the concept. So I, I've got one example here that I've, uh, I have courtesy of Siemens because it was a very nice animation I saw presented recently. And it's the kind of the concept of how we take simulation of, in this instance, fluid mechanics and heat transfer to manage the thermal performance of, of some circuitry. So not an oil and gas example, but it's a good example of the concept of design exploration being coupled with simulation. Here, the example I'm going to give, we have many variables in the design. And so it's the, it's the thermal management, the, uh, the heat transfer, and the heat removal out of a uh, electronic system. We have many variables, which gives us many design options, which from a simulation point of view gives us many simulations, maybe many millions based on the number of variables that we could have actually have. Uh, and fundamentally, we want to find the best design as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. But maybe more broadly than that, understand the families of designs, the types of design that might give us the, uh, the performance that we need. And so here's an animation showing 
many designs, this is the automation of the process of design of searching the design space where we may have a million different options. We're using an algorithm driven search engine uh, here using the, uh, the heat software, which I'll give some examples of in a moment to actually uh, within a few hundred analyses, uh, reduce the mass of the heat sinks required to, for effective thermal management of this, uh, this component. Uh, in a situation where many millions of different options might actually exist. So fundamentally, the concept of design exploration, is, as, as I try and explain it or as I understand it, is to find the designs in a lot less uh, design iterations than we would do if we were to manually search through the, the opportunity, the, the design space we have available to us. So it's to use algorithms to get there quicker. And in the meantime, automate as much of the simulation process as we can to allow the engineer to, to spend more time looking at the data, understanding the data and the relationships between the different variables, the different parameters, so that we can be engineers rather than uh, more of our time being spent as, as analysts in the process. Uh, and the fi findings of this particular case is we have a baseline design uh, and using design-based exploration, the right-hand image there is a 51% uh, reduction in the, in the mass required to offer a 25% cooling improvement, and that's been found through automated search. So to go back to oil and gas, I've got now two examples. One is how to use design exploration in the design of a riser, and the second is to the option, design of an offshore supply vessel. Uh, for the riser design, I'll go into first. The, the target here really is to, is to demonstrate the riser design process and how you could introduce cost as well as technical uh, constraints and requirements into the design process. So here the target we want to do is design a, a riser where we minimize the cost, but also minimize the top tension of the riser where it's connected to the, to the vessel. So if we look at the, uh, the scenario we have, we're designing a riser in 300 meters of water. The, the base case design, I'm sure, sorry if the riser doesn't show up very clearly on everyone's screens here. We have uh, the buoyancy section is, isn't very clearly very clearly displayed here, uh, and here's touched down onto the, uh, the seabed, 300 meters of water. The initial base case design is a 430 meter long riser connected to the uh, floating production unit. It's liquid filled in the case demonstrated here. Uh, and what we're going to do is, is aim to design that riser to meet all of the requirements that are there below in the bottom part of this slide. So the requirements technically are that we, uh, we need to minimize line tension but it must not exceed 100 kilonewtons. We can't allow compression in the riser. Uh, we have a minimum bend radius of three meters, highlighted on the image to the right, and various other technical constraints that we're trying to, uh, trying to make sure we meet whilst designing the riser uh, with the, the sort of top line objectives to minimize the cost of the, uh, the riser itself and to minimize the line tension at the vessel. So here we're introducing a whole host of requirements, constraints, uh, but also non-technical objectives, which are minimizing the cost. So we have a cost model for the riser built in Excel, which is then going to interact with our riser analysis and our design exploration. So the starting point for the, the analysis and the design space exploration is, is to come up with a base case design. Uh, and that's where the experienced engineer, the riser designer, starts out with a, uh, a riser that's 430 meters in length. The total cost is predicted to be around two and a half million euros. And for this base case design, around 76 uh, kilonewtons uh, dynamic line tension at, at, the, at the connection with the vessel. And with the number of variables we showed on the previous slide, the number of constraints and the number of variables we have available to us, there's a huge number of simulations would be required if we were to just uh, work our way through all of the different options that we have available to us. So if we uh, couple the simulation of the riser using here the FlexCom tool, so it's a, a riser, a, a static and dynamic riser analysis tool used very widely in the oil and gas industry in riser design and, and riser analysis and, and various offshore applications. But here FlexCom is the tool used to analyze the riser behavior. And the multidisciplinary design exploration is performed using uh, the HEADS tool. So HEADS is a design exploration tool which will interact with a whole range of simulation tools, but also models developed in, uh, in Excel or MathCAD where you could, uh, you could define perhaps in this instance a cost model for the riser. 
uh, and it will control the analysis, it will control multiple analyses uh, and account for all of the design constraints you have, which could be both technical and commercial. Uh, and using algorithms, it will search the available design space or the available space you have within your constraints uh, and more efficiently find the designs that meet the requirements and the objectives that you have. So if we move to the a quick animation that demonstrates what he is doing with Flexcom. So here in the, uh, the top image, we have essentially a representation of the, of the Flexcom model, uh, very, very simply demonstrated in a graph. So these are the profiles of the risers that are investigated. Uh, so they're analyzed within Flexcom, and you can see the different profiles that are being analyzed. The data is being sent out of the Flexcom analysis into HEADS, where HEADS is, is exploring what we're going to do search for next, uh, understanding the data itself and what we can analyze. And the, the bottom graph here demonstrates the results. Uh, we're only showing the results here against one of the variables, which was the, uh, the cost of the riser. Uh, obviously, there's, there's findings, there's results of each of the analyses based on all of the constraints, which are reiterated here on the right-hand side. So every analysis that's successful, shown, which is shown by a blue dot, of which there are, are not as many as red dots. Red dots are analyses where we haven't met one of the constraints that we've set on the design process. So it could be that uh, we have a line tension that exceeds 100 kilonewtons, we may have compression in the system, or we may exceed the minimum bend radius, uh, and so on for those different constraints. And the, the analyses that aren't meeting those constraints or those requirements are shown by red dots. But within there, there are blue dots uh, being joined together by the blue line, which is tracing the best performing uh, analyses. It's joining together the, the reducing cost of the analyses for each design configuration identified that meets all of the constraints and is uh, it, the cost associated with that. And so that goes through, in this instance, about 600 different sim uh, analyses or simulations were performed. Uh, when we started out, we talked about the huge number of scenarios uh, would have been the order of millions of different configurations had we actually said how many do configurations could we have. But within 600, we've actually got to our final answer. So within here, which I'm going to go on to the next slide, is 600 evaluations analyzed. Uh, and the cost, you can see the blue line has been dropping through that process. From, uh, from 2.5 million euros, which was around the base case, down uh, to, uh, to around 2 million euros. And if we zoom into that and remove some of the infeasible analyses that didn't meet our constraints, uh, we zoom in here, the blue dots now become much more apparent when we zoom in. But here we're, we're presenting the cost on the vertical axis of the riser against the line tension, which if you remember our, our target performance for the system was to, to minimize cost and minimize line tension. Uh, and so all of those blue dots there meet all of our technical constraints. And the, the, if we trace the bottom of this blue line, the dots at the, at the bottom here are the ones that are lowest cost against line tension. But what we can see is there's a definite trend that as, as cost reduces, so as we get a lower cost design, we are seeing an increase in line tension. Uh, the target constraint was that the line tension should be below 100 kilonewtons, therefore everything that's blue here does meet that requirement. But we can understand the trend. So whilst meeting the design requirements, uh, there's the base case design here with a blue, uh, black square around it. You can see everything else is, is, is lower cost, but not necessarily, not necessarily lower line tension at the vessel. Some of them exceed the line tension, but they are all lower cost than the base case design. So there's a trade-off in this system. If we want the lowest cost, we have to accept that the line tension goes up. But if we have set a design constraint, a maximum line tension of 100 kilonewtons, then we have for all of these met that requirement. But it allows us to understand maybe we want to uh, be more stringent on that line tension value. And if we were to limit it to, to 80 kilonewtons, then we still understand that we can do that at reduced cost compared to the base case design. So I think that the findings of the, uh, the analysis here was that using design exploration, we were able to find a range of different solutions, all of which met the design, the technical constraints uh, set for the riser design. The cost reduction range was between 0.6 million and, and 0.4 million euros, which is a 24% down to a 15% reduction. Uh, and that trade-off in, in cost was offset by the fact that it, as we reduced the cost, we see an increasing uh, line tension. 
but in all cases we met the requirements uh, but we need to we can understand now with that data why, where we want to trade off cost against performance of the system but I think the key the key value to, to what we see here is that one is that we've introduced a non-technical variable we've introduced cost as a design variable into our analyses we've explored a whole host of possible designs in a, in a field of many millions of possibilities we've explored the designs and found the best designs or the range of best designs within a few hundred iterations we've understood the trade-off in performance and cost uh, and I think one of the key things is we've done this in a, in a reduced time through the automation process the time and engineering effort required in that whole analysis process uh, is reduced which both reduce costs both in the in the end design solution but also in the process of engineering uh, required to find that solution so the, the second example I've got is a, a little bit shorter but it was just to take a Another area of oil and gas, and I think the, these sorts of approaches could be used in, in any of the aspects of oil and gas, whether it's be process and separation design, subsea thermal uh, design, erosion prediction, but I'm just taking two examples here. And this one is, second example is the design of an offshore supply vessel where uh, our target is to reduce, is looking at fuel reduction of, based on the whole design of the uh, offshore supply vessel. So the motivation of our, our work is to essentially reduce the drag, minimize the resistance of the vessel, improve the hydrodynamic performance of the vessel uh, with a target of reducing the fuel costs associated with it. And so to do that, we need to optimize the hull design and we need to account for a, a two different scenarios. One is fully loaded when the uh, supply vessel is heading out to a, an offshore facility. It will be more likely to be fully loaded or maybe when it's coming back and it's been loaded offshore. Uh, and then in transit when it's empty, when it's either back to shore or back to the platform empty, it's going to have two different scenarios. So we need to make sure that we account for both of those in the design process when it will sit at different positions relative to the water level. Uh, when it's fully loaded and when it's empty, it has different transit speeds. So uh, we're accounting for different speeds of the vessel. We're accounting for different freeboards or, or drafts, the height in which the, uh, the vessel center, of, uh, center of, of, of mass, center of motion sits relative to the, uh, the, the sea surface. In this instance, we've uh, assessed 150 different hull forms, uh, again, using the same search algorithms for the design space exploration. So in terms of the tools used here, where last time we used the HEAT software with Flexcom, this time we're using, uh, we're again using the HEAT software to control the design space exploration, but HEAT this time is going to be integrating with uh, with our design model, our model of the uh, the hull, which is performed with uh, with Rhino, so that's controlling the actual generating the new hull designs, uh, and then the hydrodynamic performance, the fluid mechanics is solved using Star CCM Plus, uh, the CFD tool, to to analyze the uh, the vessel performance, uh, and Heeds is kind of controlling the interaction between all of these and helping us search the design space and find those designs in a, a quicker way than we could without design space exploration. So here's the starting point, the baseline design. Again, with all of these, these, uh, these approaches, we start with a baseline design and look to improve that based on our requirements or our constraints. So here you can see the, uh, the hydrodynamics uh, and the, uh, the free surface behavior of the, the empty and the full vessel. If we move on to the design space exploration here again, we're performing CFD analysis of the, uh, the multi-phase flow around the vessel. So we're looking at both the, uh, the, the flow of uh, the free surface tracking and the flow of the liquid, the water past the hull uh, and monitoring the, the drag uh, and the hull, hull's performance and using the Sherpa algorithm within HEADS to search out those designs. So this isn't a random selection of designs. It is learning as it finds data. It starts to learn uh, what parameters are key to the performance of the system and finds those very quickly uh, and trends towards the best designs in a much more efficient manner than, than any of us as, as engineers um, would be able to without it. So 300 designs are assessed and performance improvements shown here. Uh, we end up with a fully loaded vessel uh, with a, over 30% fuel saving. Uh, and again, for an empty vessel in transit, over 30% saving having performed around 300 different designs 
Uh, again, of which whilst we've uh, analyzed 300, there may have been many hundreds of thousands of configurations based on the design variables of length of the whole uh, draft, width of the vessel, all the design considerations that we could account for within that analysis. So just to close up, because that's me at my 20 minutes time slot, uh, it's my belief that engineering simulation with, with design exploration really can help us move towards simulation-led design, and we're starting to see that on projects that we're involved in both in oil and gas and in, in other industries, uh, where it's enabling us to integrate simulation much more efficiently with the design process uh, and explore designs, find our solutions, uh, more quickly, having the confidence that we've explored more of the available design space than we could uh, manually within the system using more traditional techniques. It does reduce, I believe, the, the time spent as engineers in an analysis tool. So it, it helps streamline the process of analysis. And I, I think fundamentally it enables engineers and we're engineers in our company and allows engineers to spend more time being engineers, less time involved in the anal analysis or simulation process. So we spend more time looking at the real data, understanding what that means to our uh, designs or our customers' engineering systems and, and products. And I think because it can help us get to designs quicker and more efficiently, it can help us be more efficient as engineers. It's certainly one aspect that companies working in engineering design and operations uh, would be uh, sensible to look into to help manage the sort of lower for longer environment that we're, we're currently working in. It does require the will to change uh, and invest the time and effort to, to explore it, but our experience of design space exploration was that we quickly got to grips with the tools that we've used uh, within, we're already using simulation widely, but we only in the last 18 months to two years have started to use design space exploration and got to grips with it very quickly would be my, uh, my experience of it within our organization. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening and pass back to Jay. My contact details are there, or you can find us online or through uh, Jay, who's organized the event. So what I'm going to show you today is a demonstration of um, how um, we can make this transition from sort of performing um, CFD analysis in, in a more kind of traditional way um, to uh, this automated design space exploration and optimization approach. And before I go any further, I'm just going to, uh, to use another illustrative example. So this is, uh, this is a, a case study from uh, one of our customers, uh, FMC Technologies. And this is uh, just a summary of, of their kind of uh, transition to this new uh, form of optimization. So previously using a design of experiments approach and over 55 iterations, they were able to uh, certainly improve their design, but they found uh, that they were, they were chasing a requirement on, on the outlet temperature from this subsea heat exchanger. Um, they, they were unable to, to quite reach that value using uh, the existing approach. And so they, uh, they, they gave heat a try uh, using um, 11 or, or even more uh, different design parameters. Uh, and over sort of 150 designs, uh, they found that they were actually able to improve uh, the performance by uh, 20%. Um, in addition to that, on, on the right-hand side here, you can see they actually were also able to sort of identify different design families, um, so sort of different distinct types of geometries which uh, could, could give them optimal performance. And so this allows uh, the engineers to make basically a more educated decision when it comes to the, uh, the, the final selection. So I'm going to show uh, a sort of a demonstration of how this, uh, this transition can be achieved. I'm going to use this example case, which is a drill bit, so it's a fairly straightforward CFD simulation. And just to explain the background, um, during, uh, during the drilling process, uh, the, the rock fragments, which are cut away from the, uh, from the rock face by these, these teeth, uh, cleared away from the bottom of the drill bit and extracted ultimately from the borehole using uh, the, the drilling fluids, which are pumped. Uh, down the drill string and they emerge from these red nozzles uh, as you can see in the, in the image on the right hand side. So the, uh, you can imagine that the positioning of these nozzles is, is quite critical in terms of the uh, sort of so-called cleaning efficiency of the bit, so how effectively the rock fragments are removed from, uh, from where the cutting is taking place. And so the actual uh, efficiency of the, of the drilling process and the rate of penetration of the bit can depend on and exactly um, how well that, that happens. So the question is, 
by optimizing the layout of these nozzles and the uh, and the cutting teeth, can we improve the, the cleaning efficiency of this particular drill bit? So we have a, um, a Start ECM Plus CFD simulation already, which I'll show you in a moment. And in there, uh, the, the geometry is designed using the built-in um, 3D CAD environment. And there are um, a series of design parameters defined in the model. So the user can easily go in and change, uh, for example, the angle of these blades, um, the radius of the different nozzles, and also the offset from the center line of those nozzles. And so you can imagine that the user could go in and change those values and rerun the simulation and, and take a look at the result and make, make a comparison. So in terms of, of performing an optimization study um, using the technology um, in HEADS, which Matt has just been talking about, uh, we will in this case look for a single design objective. So in the CFD simulation, we can measure the wall shear stress um, on the uh, cutting surfaces of the bit. And so that's where the fluid uh, is moving fast past the surface of the bit. And we could uh, certainly equate that to uh, the likelihood that the rock fragments will be uh, easily removed in those areas. So if we try to optimize the wall shear stress um, averaged over those cutting teeth, um, then that's probably going to take us in the right direction. So because uh, we have some, some design constraints we need to meet, um, we can put those into the, into the study. So uh, for example, we don't want to have an excessive pressure drop, so we don't, so we don't want to have to pump uh, drilling fluid down that adds an excessive pressure. So we put in a constraint that that pressure should be uh, less than 3,000 pascals. Um, and we, we also don't want to find a design where there's a highly uneven flow distribution around the bit. So we could actually measure the, uh, the mass flow coming out from all of these nozzles and calculate the standard deviation uh, and make sure that that's below um, 0 0.1 in this case. So that's to try and ensure a reasonably uniform flow field. And so ultimately, what are we trying to achieve? Well, we want um, an automated process where the, uh, the optimizer can alter the CAD design. It can regenerate the uh, mesh for the CFD calculation. It can rerun the solver um, and re-extract really all of the reports, so the, the, uh, the numbers we want to get out, and also the visual post-processing, which you can see here. And it will take all of that information, and it will firstly compare against the constraints which need to be met, see if it fails either of those constraints, and also measure uh, the results, so the raw shear stress in this case, um, and try then uh, to complete the loop, uh, so to adjust, readjust the CAD and rerun that whole, that whole uh, loop. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, I'm now going to show you how that can be, how, uh, how that can be done using Start ECM Plus. And so I'm going to dive into, uh, into the model here, which is already set up. So this is, this is the drill bit model. Uh, as you can see, um, we already have a flow solution computed. So there is the, there's the wall shears just calculated on those cutting teeth. Um, we can take a look at the, the streamlines and see how the flow passes around the bit, for example. Um, and so you could imagine uh, that, that at this point, uh, the user might want to, get, want to go in here and change the, the design parameters, as I mentioned. So there's the CAD model defined, and here are the design parameters. So we could go and change that, that angle, for example, and then rerun the simulation. But to set up um, a natural optimization study, we can use uh, this built-in tool here. So I click on the gear icon, and I can create a new automated study. So I'm just going to expand this window. Um, so this is a, a sort of an integrated plugin for Start ECM Plus, which is essentially running in the background uh, the optimization tool, which we've seen already uh, in, the, in the HEAT software. So the first thing I need to select is the type of, of run that I'm doing. So I might want to be doing a design suite, where, for example, I've predetermined all of the designs I wish to run. I might want to do a design of experiments. In this case, I'm going to use the Sherpa algorithm, which is an intelligent, adaptive um, algorithm. And I also have an option here to choose between a uh, simple objective-based optimization or a multiple objective trade-off study. So that might be where I wanted to to find the optimal uh, balance between two sort of opposing uh, objectives. So that could be, for example, 
in this case, the raw shear stress and the pressure drop, I might want to try and minimize both, uh, maximize one of those and minimize the other. In this case, I'm going to use a simple single objective study um, so that uh, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. So the next tab along here, I, I can start selecting um, the, uh, well, the defining features of my study, really. So firstly, I need to create some variables. So these are things which the optimizer is allowed to change in my CFD model, essentially. <clears throat> so you can see I can choose between lots of different uh, aspects of the simulation. I can, I can change physics models, mesh settings, and all sorts of things. In this case, um, sorry, I'm going to look in the, in the CAD model, and I'm going to select all of the design parameters that are currently defined in the CAD model. So that brings in all of those variables, and you can see there's a minimum a uh, baseline value, a maximum value uh, increment defined. So I can go and change any of these values uh, if I want to, uh, to define the ranges uh, which are acceptable to me uh, as the designer. So the next thing I need to do is create the responses. So this is saying, um, how is the optimizer going to um, get the results out of the software, um, the, the relevant numbers which it needs to compare? So in this case, we're going to take the average wall shear stress um, and also the standard deviation of mass flow. So these are reports which have already been defined in the CFD model. So I will take those two um, as my responses. Um, so now I need to define which one of these uh, is my objective. So in this case, I'm trying to maximize the, uh, the wall shear stress. So I can right click here and select set as objective. And that will appear down here, and you can see I can change the goal to, to maximize that. I'd also like to set uh, this other response as my constraint, so I right click again, set as constraint. Uh, and I can put in um, either a lower limit or an upper limit, or, or in fact both, so I put in an upper limit in this case. So that's all the information that the optimizer needs to, to perform the study, but of course, as the, uh, as the sort of supervising engineer, I would also like to be able to see all that visual post-processing um, and any plots um, which I've defined in the model. So I click here to create model views, and I've got various scenes which I've uh, defined in the model, so I can pick some of those. I might take the streamlines, the wall shear stress. Um, a geometry scene would be useful so I can see actually um, very clearly what, what geometry it's chosen. I could also go into my plots, which I've defined and uh, take this uh, uh, standard deviation monitor plot, for example, and the pressure drop plot. I can also take the residuals plot so that I can um, make sure my uh, run is behaving well. And I click OK. So it's going to save all of those post-processing uh, graphics as the, runs, as the runs go along, and then we'll be able to look at those afterwards. So then I move on to the, uh, the assembly. So this is now where we're looking at the logistics of how this is going to be run. So we can pick a number of simultaneous jobs. I might run so two simultaneous jobs. Uh, I might use four cores per job. And in this case, um, I'm going to pick 100 runs, for example. I can uh, make selections about my licensing options. I can also um, modify the process by adding in any uh, additional macros that I want. And finally, I go in here and click on the run button to start off the, the study. So of course, I'm not going to do that now because I'm, I'm actually already running out of time, but uh, I'm going to pop over to the heat post environment. So this is, um, this is the, uh, the post process of which we would be able to view the results um, coming in as the simulations are run. We can also use it after the, after the event like this to, uh, to bring together all of that information and, and try and analyze it. So here we have a summary. Um, so we can see that we've run 69 um, feasible runs and 34 infeasible runs. And of course, well, what does that mean? So that's saying that there are 69 runs where um, we successfully ran the model and, and we also satisfied um, the constraints. So we can have a look at the, um, the different designs we've run. So in the table, of course, those are all of the designs and all of the relevant um, design parameters. Uh, we could also look at the, the constraint violations, so you could see um, that we've had five violations of the standard deviation of mass flows between the different nozzles, 
and 32 violations of the pressure drop. So this is where the optimizer has, has chosen a run, uh, chosen a geometry which violates one of those constraints. Uh, however, it's useful to be able to see that and to be able to understand what types of geometries cause that problem. Uh, so we can look at the uh, performance history. So this is showing, in fact, if I look at this one instead, this is the wall shear stress um, with the design ID. So essentially, this is the sort of um, time axis along the bottom, and it's showing you how the optimizer has reached this final design up here with the maximum value. We could also um, dive into the, the visual post-processing and have a look at uh, the actual um, <coughs> the, the raw shear stress plot and the geometry. I could also click on any of these different design points and you can see all of the images below will, will quickly update uh, and uh, display the relevant image. So this is a very nice, convenient tool for bringing together all of that post-processing um, to, to see in one place. In terms of, of actually understanding um, the sensitivities, I find uh, that this plot here, as you can see, there's a lots of different types of plots we can create, and they, uh, there's really quite a powerful post-processing environment. Um, there's a nice link between the plots as well. So if I, uh, if I select a bunch of plots up here, you can see if I go back to my objective history, those different design points would be selected. But looking at the parallel plot, um, this is showing each individual simulation is, is one of these lines, and it's connecting together um, the value of the wall shear stress, which is, of course, our objective, um, with the different design parameters, so the angle, the distance, and the radius. So if I select these ones at the top, what I'm doing is selecting all of the designs which have high values of wall shear stress. And you can see that they actually follow um, a very uh, similar path through the rest of the plot. So that's saying that they all have a fairly similar angle of the cutting teeth. Um, they're all pretty much uh, taking the minimum value for the whole distances. So they're, in other words, they're keeping the drill, the, the nozzles close to the center line. Uh, they're also going for the maximum value of the, uh, of the two different radius parameters. So immediately we're getting insight into the design. We're seeing that actually, you know, maybe if we could move the, uh, move the nozzles closer to the center line, uh, we could actually improve even further and maybe go back to our mechanical designers and, and have a think about that. So I'm going to, uh, to jump back to my PowerPoint just to sum up. Um, so here is uh, here's a, the summary slide showing, showing that best design. And uh, I have a slide here which is uh, just comparing that with the baseline. So you can see we've made quite a big improvement to the, the average wall shear stress value. Uh, We've also um, increased rather the, uh, the standard deviation um, of, of the mass flows between the different, uh, the different nozzles that's termed the flow uniformity. So in other words, we've, we've reached a slightly less uniform flow distribution around the bit. Uh, however, in this case, it's, it's well below our constraint and that's perfectly acceptable. Again, we've increased the pressure drop to just below that constraint value of 3,000 pascals. And of course, this makes perfect sense um, that in order to, to get higher nozzle velocities, um, we generally need to, to apply a higher uh, driving pressure. And you can see, um, again, those, uh, those design parameters are really meet, reaching the minimum allowable and maximum allowable values. So from this uh, sort of brief look at this, at this design, we've really gained, we've we firstly improved our design, we've at the same time gain considerable insight into the trends. So that concludes the, uh, the demonstration, the software demonstration, and with that, I will pass back to you, Jay. So it just remains for me to say thank you to uh, Dr. Matt Straw from Norton Straw Consultants. Thank you to Alex Graham, and of course, thank you to you all. With that, the session is closed. Goodbye. <laughs>